So thank you so much, Professor Anuj Maheshwari, Professor uh, Nasim Verma sir, and all of he you here at ACP for this excellent choice of topic. And a warm welcome to all of you who has joined today. And thank you, chairpersons, for the kind words of introduction. So the topic for me today is non-thyroid illness or sick youth thyroid syndrome in critically ill patients. Now let's start with a case. It's a 64-year-old gentleman with community-acquired pneumonia and sepsis. Got admitted to ICU five days back on mechanical ventilation with pressure supports. Uh, if you look at the vitals, the temperature is 38.8. Blood pressure is 98 over 64. The pulse is 130. Skin warm, dry, no proptosis. If you look at the neck examination, normal size thyroid without any palpable nodules. Neurological examination, given mild delayed deep tendon reflex, and this is what warranted the resident to order a TFT. And this is how the TFT looked. If you look at the TSH, it was 0 0.4, free T4 was 11.6, and total T3 was 50. And you see the reference range on your right hand side. So which of the following is the likely cause of his condition? So you have Graves disease, you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, euthyroid sick syndrome or non-thyroidal illness, and subacute thyroiditis. So these are your choices. And we'll come back and revisit these options after we had talked about this. So let's go back to the basics and look at the axis. So we know that there's a negative feedback mechanism that works. And this is how it works in normal, you know. In primary hypothyroidism, there is uh, less free T4. And because of that, you have increased TSH and uh, increased TRH. In primary hypothyroid, it's the other way around as well. And of course, there's a log linear relationship between TSH and free T4. Now, deiodinases are very important because they are the behind the scene puppeteers. And usually what is driven is conversion of T4 to T3. And what is suppressed is conversion of T4 to reverse T3. So this is the active mechanism and this is inactive in normal circumstances. Now, if you want to interpret thyroid function test, this is how it should be in a euthyroid state. Now, in conditions which is a hyperthyroid state like Graves' disease, toxic multinodular goiter, you'll have increased free T4 and free T3 with reduced TSH. So toxic adenoma, thyroiditis, drugs like we had been hearing about before, amiodarone, ex iodine excess, excess thyroxine intake, uh, factitious uh, thyroiditis. So all of these will lead on to uh, increased free T4, free T3 and reduced TSH. On the other hand of the spectrum, if you look, increased TSH with reduced free T4 and free T3 in iodine deficiency, neck irradiation, Wedel's thyroiditis, congenital hypothyroidism, post radioiodine therapy, thyroidectomy, hypothyroid phase, etc. There's another condition called the subclinical hyperthyroidism where the TSH levels are might be reduced with normal free T4 and free T3. And also the drugs, steroids, dopamine, assay interference can be the result of this. Opposite end of the spectrum again, where you see uh, um, mildly reduced uh, or increased TSH with increased free T4 and free T3. This is assay interference, thyroxine replacement, etc. Subclinical hypothyroidism, again, poor compliance with thyroxine, malabsorption, etc. But finally, what we are interested in is the non thyroidal il illness, where you see a TSH which is normal or mildly reduced, as was the scenario that we had shown you before, with a reduced free T4 and free T3. So another mimicker of this particular condition could be central hypothyroidism. So when can TSH measurements alone be misleading? In conditions like central hypothyroidism, non-thyroidal illness, what we are talking about today, recent treatment for thyrotoxicosis, resistance to thyroid hormone or TSH secreting pituitary adenoma, where the picture is very similar. So what occurs in euthyroid sick syndrome? 
So this is, there is a critical illness and multiple things happen. So reduced food intake, hypothalamic adaptations, pituitary adaptations, intrathyroidal changes, leading on to decreased serum TH concentrations and altered tissue TH metabolism resulting in more or less bioavailability of the T3. So this is, there is an inflammation that happens and because of that, this is how it normally handles. So hypothalamic thyroid hormone signaling during inflammation, this is what you see. Um, so D2 promoter, increased D2 deiodinase and there's a conversion of D4 to T3. T3 goes and attaches to the beta subunit of the thyroid receptor. But in euthyroid 6 syndrome, what happens is a relatively common finding acute or chronic illness and absence of intrinsic abnormality of the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid function. And this is the normal what you see on the left hand side. D1 is active, so there is conversion of T4 to T3. And also there's conversion of reverse T3 to T2. But in non-thyroidal illness, the D1 is inactive, the activity of the D1 goes down. So conversion of T4 to T3 doesn't happen and conversion of reverse T3 to T2 doesn't happen. So the levels of reverse T3 go up. So this is exactly the scenario what we come across, decreased D1 activity and decreased D2 activity, reading onto reduced RT3 clearance and reduced T3 production and augmented D3 activity leading on to increased T3 inactivation and reverse T3 production, resulting in reduced T3 and T4 levels and increased reversed T3 levels. So if you look at the thyroid function test in this scenario, you'll see low T4, low T3, low T4 syndrome, high T4 syndromes or other abnormalities. Again, what we want to concentrate on is this particular thing that severe illness with uh, T4 and free T4 that is low or low, low normal TSH uh, and if the measured uh, T3 is low, then we also need to look at the serum cortisol level. So if the cortisol level is more than 30, that's fine. But if it's below, then ACTH should be drawn and the patient must be given supportive cortisol therapy. Over on top of that, we need to also determine uh, FSH in the postmenopausal woman as a sign of pituitary function. Also use of aspirin, dilantin, carbamazepine should be noted. And dopamine used in this setting of severe illness can induce clear-cut hypothyroidism. So this is the prognostic graph that we see in euthyroid 6 syndrome. And you can see in here, mild, moderate, and severe. So lower the T3 level, more is the severity. And gradually during the recovery phase, you see the T3 levels going back up again. Reverse three T3 also increases and then gets better uh, as the patient recovers. So how common is it in ICU setup? Abnormal TFCs are very common. More than 70% patients show a low T3 and 50% of the patients show a low T4. So euthyroid 6 syndrome, relatively common finding following any acute or chronic illness, absence of an intrinsic abnormality uh, of the hypothalamo pituitary a thyroid function, rather it is considered a secondary adaptive change. Avoid testing unless strongly suspected. Pre-illness TFT is very vital and invaluable, so if you have, you can compare. Thyroid hormone replacement is not needed. And follow-up testing is necessary after recovery. So these are the reasons why all of these changes occur. So if you look at the TSH, we said that it could be normal, high or low. Low TSH is because of suppression of the hypothalamic pituitary axis by inflammatory cytokines, abnormal TSH glycosylation, decreased leptin resulting in low thyrotropin releasing hormone, increased hypothalamic and pituitary type 2 idothyroid deiodinase or D2 activity, and transient TSH increase. Why do we see a normal high or low T4? because of increased direct free T4, possibly because of inhibitors of T4 to binding proteins. Total T4, if you look at, they're normal or low, and this is because of low production of the binding proteins, decreased binding to uh, thyroxine binding globulin and low TSH. T3 is low, but this is because of decreased uh, D1 activity, what we had seen before, low production of thyroxine binding globulin, 
and decreased binding to thyroxine binding globulin and low TSH. Reverse T3 is high, increased T3 activity, I beg your pardon, uh, because of the increased D3 activity that we had discussed before. So this is again uh, talking about the same recovery graph. So as the numbers, as the numbers become more severe, we see there's a drop in the free T3 and increase in the reverse T3. What are the caveats with the TFT in non-thyroidal illness? So low T3, most common finding, and seen even early in the disease. Low T4 in moderate to severe illness, additionally due to thyroid binding globulin, transerythrin, and albumin. So again, the chances of survival, this is in COVID-19, so euthyroid 6 syndrome as a prognostic indicator of COVID-19 pulmonary involvement associated with poorer disease prognosis and increased mortality. Pretty much the same thing that we talk about. So if you have very low T3 numbers, that will mean that there is a prolonged hospital stay and also severity of the illness. During recovery from the incurrent illness, thyroid hormone and TSH return to normal. In some patients, TSH may become overtly elevated for short periods of time. And this rise in the TSH typically precedes the increase in the T4 and T3. And it's important to be aware of this transient phenomena in order to avoid appropriate, inappropriate diagnosis and treatment. Now let's come back to the clinical case that we showed. Uh, let's rule out one by one. So the first choice was Graves' disease. So patient does not have any findings of Graves' disease, tachycardia, fever, etc., on symptoms. And if you look at the Graves' disease profile, thyroid profile, there'd be increased T3 and T4 with the suppressed TSH. So we don't find anything of that sort in this particular person. So Hashimoto's thyroiditis, again, patient's TSH is borderline low, not compatible with the Hashimoto's where TSH should be elevated. Finally, subacute thyroiditis, um, again, uh, infection can trigger destruction of the thyroid gland and transiently it might land up in a hypothyroid state. Uh, transient elevation of the free T4 and T3, but this doesn't fit into the scenario as well. So the final choice that we have is the euthyroid 6 syndrome or the non-thyroidal illness. So should our patient receive LT4? So sometimes it's better to do nothing than uh, treat and this is one of those conditions we do not have very convincing data regarding the use of levothyroxine in this condition. These are the various studies that has given multiple interventions from using combination GHRH or TRH, for example. Some of them have used T3, T4, but none of them seems to be very, very convincing. And sometimes, probably it seems at the end of the day that if you do nothing, that is going to be helpful. So, if we want to summarize the management, thyroid hormone replacement is not needed in patients with euthyroid 6 syndrome. Treatment and management of the underlying medical illness is the focus. However, periodic monitoring of the thyroid function should be done. After discharge from the hospital, thyroid function abnormalities may persist for several weeks. And in clinically euthyroid patients, thyroid function tests should be repeated six weeks after hospitalization to confirm overt uh, thyroid dysfunction and persistent TSH abnormality. And again, if you have a pre-admission value, it's invaluable because you can compare. So guidelines for management, two general guidelines are given. First, measure the TSH only if there is a high clinical suspicion of thyroid dysfunction. If TSH is abnormal and further workup is done, if the TSH is greater than 20 uh, or undetectable, then euthyroid 6 syndrome is less likely to be the cause. So when serum TSH is not elevated, euthyroid 6 syndrome should be considered in patients with known thyroid disease and low serum free T4. What about the prognosis? As we mentioned, low serum T3 is correlated with an increased length of hospital stay, intensive care unit admission, and the need for mechanical ventilation, and this was done in the acute heart failure patients. Also, the serum T4 value correlates with the outcome in critically ill patients. Those who have a number less than three microgram, uh, micrograms per deciliter have been associated with mortality rates, which is in excess of 85%. What are the differential diagnosis? Hashimoto's thyroiditis, hyperthyroidism, 
thyrotoxicosis, panhypopituitarism, and thyroid dysfunction induced by amiodarone. Role of parenteral nutrition. So when early full parenteral support is used to resolve the caloric deficit, the peripheral changes in the thyroid axle partially normalize, but the central suppression does not. So clinical pearls from today's talk would be in patients with acute illness, do not assess thyroid function unless there is a strong indication. If TFT assessment is indicated for critically ill patient, serum TSH and free T4 should be uh, measured. TFT in critically ill patients usually show low serum uh, total T3, normal or low serum TSH, and normal or low free T4. Many drugs in ICU setup can alter the thyroid hormone levels. Thyroid hormone therapy is not recommended for critically ill patients with low T3, low T4, or both. During recovery, some patients may have mild elevations in the TSH levels, and thyroid hormone levels may take several weeks or months to return back to normal. So you have to keep on following up these patients. And patients with serum TSH more than 20 during recovery phase, more likely to have permanent primary hypothyroidism. So non-thyroid illness is a relatively common finding following acute or chronic disease. Absence of intrinsic abnormality uh, of the hypothalamo-pituitary thyroid function rather considered a secondary adaptive change. Avoid testing unless strongly suspected. And pre-treatment TFT, if available, consider that as a lost treasure. And thyroid hormone replacement uh, is not very helpful in this scenario. So with this, thank you so much.